I just had a fortuitous event. Somebody wants to lend me their car for a week. And I haven't driven in six weeks. One thing, though, is being on extra Seroquel, that's not great. So maybe tonight I will cut it down to half a Seroquel and one and a half Trazodone. But now I feel like I need to do some planning of what I can do for the next week with a vehicle. So hopefully I can do some self-dialogue but also some embodied self-dialogue and embodied mania. So how would I live for a week in California with a car? Stay tuned. So that changes the landscape of things a little bit as I will be able to further map the landscape around here. And it'll be fun to drive because I do like driving and I haven't in a while. And another thing too is that a bit of my story is going to be in the Emerging Proud book that is coming out in about six weeks. And it's safe to talk about it because it's not out yet, but it will be by the time I release this. And Katie asked for a two-line blurb to the readers for hope and inspiration. And I wrote down Our brains are resilient, neuroplastic, and quantum, with infinite capacity to learn, unfold, and create. We've seen and touched possibilities yet to be made manifest. So hold these visions in your heart so that the minds of the many might be touched and see the possible world too. So I have a few notes on my computer and I'm not planning to sit inside often to be able to read off my computer and talk about it. So I'll get right to it. I made up a word. I was thinking about how dialogue in a way is kind of like improv, but just a conversational improv in a way, whereas improv is more embodied, but I created the word diimprovologue which is a combination of dialogue and improv. And I wonder if that can be brought into embodied mania. So it's not just an improv and just playful, but there's some form of communion and dialogue happening at the same time. I feel it's possible to see people's possible selves. When I was able to look at people and see them light up and become their flamboyant animated version of themselves, their die in provologue version of themselves. We are all there underneath the encasing of thought and societal structures. In a way, this other language comes out of our eyes and heart. We can actually see that which we want to say from a new perception. And it seems life energy is turned into thought, which has no basis in actuality. It's from the past. And perhaps because it has no basis in reality, it can't really touch reality, so it has to turn back in on itself. And it's like this cycle keeps going because something is trying to meet reality, but nothing ever does if it's from thought. So words can't meet life, so they go back in circles. And life energy created by life goes out to infinity, and it actually changes the pattern of the whole ever so slightly whereas thought is repetitious and doesn't change the whole. And it seems like thought as the me is false integration. The me can't integrate into the whole because it has no relationship to the whole. So instead of integration, we get repetition. The brain is being used as a repetition device instead of actually integrating and creating. Can we approach life with beauty? Flow is a flow of beauty. Can our gestures and actions move with the algorithm of beauty? Can each 
step we take be artful. And if we approach with beauty, the thing doesn't matter. The thing we approach, what matters is that we approach with beauty and in that we have some relationship to it. And it seems like map consciousness is an exercise in beauty, exercising us in the field of beauty and exercising our beauty muscle gestures and our beauty neurology. I wonder if there's genes for this beauty. Can we reach out as beauty? So I don't like reading stuff, but when I write longer blurbs, I kind of have to read it. So I think this is in response to what Dr. Daniel Siegel said at the end of his neuroscience talk on the Neuroscience Summit, he said something like, we are nature. And I wrote, to say we are nature, intellectually, without a felt sense of it and sensitivity to it, is meaningless. And if we are, to integrate nature, we must understand our relationship to it. If we have no direct understanding, it is not integrated in our brain. It's just a word, a concept, an abstraction. When the mind uses the brain to start integrating nature, the immensity can short circuit the brain's circuitry, and this is exactly what is needed. To short circuit the me, when we get a glimpse of our relationship to the immensity, it starts a never-ending unfolding of understanding, of meaning, of our relationship to nature and as it. This is eternity. So, it's scary to fall out of eternity and be engulfed back into the limitations of society. This imposed limitation is a pressure on the brain. It's difficult not to go crazy. But as the understanding deepens, the immensity crowds out the me circuits in the brain. We just need enough me to take care of the body. The brain space and fluidity opens up. So this deepening understanding takes over the brain as perception. Now you see as the mind. Interesting, I'm talking to myself. So now the brain is a relational organ, playing the music of relationship. As that, we can speak as the relationship to nature and all of reality. Then we don't need science as science is due to the separating ourselves from nature with the way we use language, meeting nature and relationship with our preconceived notions of language structures which divide us up from being in direct contact. The sound is the barrier, and the sound barrier we project prevents contact. Contact and relationship with nature allows us to speak as that relationship, as the moment. And I wonder about the math of this. Not that I know much about math, but I'm seeing few variables that can go together to create something, and I don't really know what that is yet, but see if something happens. Again, as a crazy person, I can pretend that my brain might be able to come up with some math stuff. It's possible, or see willing possibility, I want to be defective in reference to this defective society. The mind installed a new value system, which has nothing to do with education and society. And I feel like beauty becomes the fuel. Beauty is the fuel. See willing possibility beauty fuel. And I was reading David Bohm's book, wholeness in the implicate order and he talks about a word vidate I think it's vidate and I'll talk about it again later if I don't get this correct but he was saying that it means to see and to understand at the same time to perceive and to understand not just to see something but to really understand and have a felt sense of 
of that thing, like to understand and to see. And to have an insight is probably similar. So to have an insight is to understand something in a moment like, aha, eureka. And so in the same way one could ask, see inciting possibility? Does one see into the possibility of that insight? Not just receiving it in terms of, no, that doesn't agree with my belief systems and my opinions that I've been told and sold and programmed to think about. And the cool thing about C as well as C in physics is the speed of light. So in the word C, as in S-E-E, -E, is also C for light. And one needs to really see the light without the interference of previous sound structures in order to have an insight. And so if I say, see inciting possibility, one might say, no see in sounding impossibility. So that is admitting that one's internal sounds are getting in the way of seeing the insight that one is declaring as an insight, is not coming from past knowledge, but is actually something that is seen in the moment. And all that word stuff with the see inciting bit, all the bit extra I just made up now. And I'm only saying that to say that new insights can come up even though I have a bit of a list here of things that I wanted to talk about. And that's why I like writing down the small point form things and not these big long things is because I can talk about things and if I write down a big thing then I have to just read it and I don't like that. When I'm reading it I'm sort of just reading it to read it and usually not much else comes up into consciousness. And so yeah, beauty is the fuel. Beauty is the fuel. And I do feel in a way that my job is to harvest these insights, insights from beauty, to give voice to the beauty that is all around as part of giving voice to the voiceless, which requires mere neurons and empathy and silence. It seems like my brain can harvest insights and perceptions because it has a direct relationship with the mind, with reality. And this is not anything special. It's how we're designed to be. We're not designed to be programmed robots because this mind is something we all share. We use the brain in service of personal pleasure, but when we strip away all the personal stuff, we have the same brain and mind, and that's what Krishnamurti talks about, is the human brain. If we were all, all of a sudden blank slates, we would just be the same human brain with the same kind of capabilities. And I was actually thinking today when I was thinking about how I've been, you know, struggling lately or something, and had to take the extra medication, but if I put it in the context of I am the world and the world is me, well, the world is struggling. So if I say I'm struggling, it makes it seem like my personal struggles, but the world is struggling. So even if it seems like I'm in a scenario where I shouldn't be struggling, then just to put it in a broader context, because I feel like I've connected with that oneness where it's all one and I felt so amazing and ecstatic, well, one can feel anything in between when one is connected to the oneness. It's not all lollipops and cotton candy. So I'm gonna try that a little bit when I'm struggling and kind of have the sense that the world is struggling and I'm picking up on it. And I haven't been struggling, I just feel kind of drugged a little bit because I've been taking extra medication and like I said the main goal right now is to get to emotional CPR so how do we translate this beauty 
by giving voice to it, by talking about it, by talking as it, by talking with it, by looking at it, by being with it, by smelling it, by touching it, by tasting it, by being in complete wonder of it, by understanding it wholly, partly. And I wrote down that when my heart races like that when I'm falling asleep, it's like some sounds and thoughts are coming in to process. And it's scary because usually I'm not really connected up with that stuff, but I feel like sometimes some of it tries to filter through me like, like a drain almost. And map consciousness is vision correction towards quantum vision and having a quantum brain. The quantum world already exists. Scientists are just touching on it, but it actually exists as a state of existence, as a state of the brain. Why don't we have access to that brain state? It's partially because the people who go into that brain state are pathologized. And I created another word. Instead of agreeing, which is sort of what you said agrees with my opinions and my past programs, a seeing is seeing something that someone's saying, something new, and meeting that instead of judging and, and, and making opinions about it as somebody is talking. To a see, one has to be open and say, I don't know, and be willing to find out. And I think nature has some hints in it. For example, when there's a loud thunder, we can't hear ourselves think, it's too loud. And also, it might scare us into not thinking for that moment. And in that moment that a person isn't thinking, the moment before that, there's often lightning, which is electrons and energy. So it's like nature sends all this energy down to the Earth's surface and then has a loud sound that quiets the human mind for a moment. And even seeing the lightning can quiet the mind for a moment. And all the thinking energy and sound energy of people, if you were to add it all up and, and play that sound over a period of time, it would probably sound like a really, really loud thunder. If you took everybody's thoughts, which is 50,000 thoughts a day, all of that sound together, one person times two times one times a million times a billion, it would be so loud. So in a way, the collective thinking of the moment is being erased with the thunder. And also we have to pay attention to nature. And we have to change our actions because of nature. When we could be changing our actions because of nature, as in going towards the beauty of it. And another thing too that I do for sure is rely on the gestures of others to remind me to do things. So I do things more visually. So if somebody drinks water, I might drink water too because I'm not thinking, oh, I should drink water. But if I see someone else do it, I can mirror that. So I remember making up a word for that when I was in the state before I was even diagnosed. I called it a sea minder because we talk about reminding people of something, but somebody sometimes can do something that makes us reminded to do something, but it's really a C-minder instead of someone saying, don't forget to do this. And the importance of that is just acknowledging that we learn from others. We Even somebody giving somebody a smile can be a C-minder to remind us to actually smile at people. And so that's how the gestures spread. They spread by mirror neurons and C-minders. And there's probably an epigenetic component to that too. And we could also say, I mirror you to say, I am copying you and I'm copying something good that you're doing or that I need to do too as a human being. It's a common thing. So it's part of the trust of the world that hints out there will remind us to do the things we need to do and one day I'm hoping to maybe go completely calendarless and just wander. Right now I have reminders in my calendar and stuff because otherwise I forget to do stuff. So I 
think I told the story about how when I was in the hospital that bad time, I've seen this pattern of light for probably 15 years and I've always kind of wondered about it, but I could see the pattern of light on the grass and each time it lit up, there was an ant there. Like the ant came out of the light, but it made me realize that that light is the movement of life. It's sort of like the flower of life, possibly. And that is the algorithm of beauty. I saw more of that yesterday. It was really windy. And I also see this sort of fluorescent green and purple everywhere. And it's really hard to explain, but it's this weird pattern and I don't see it all the time, but I can see it more in the dark. And it was dark outside, but I could still see the trees moving. And the way the lighting was, the trees as they swayed in the wind, they disappeared into darkness and then they came out of this darkness. And it was just so apparent to me that it's this pattern of emptiness that really holds the material. And it's impossible to explain, but it was just so fascinating to watch it seriously disappear and, and rematerialize. And, and it was actually supported by all these strings of purple and green light. I see the purple light more when it's dark and the green light more when it's white. And I've seen this all for like 14 years, which actually makes me feel like this whole process of the change of perception has been going on for a lot longer than even this whole mental illness diagnosis thing. So yeah, and there's this other thing that I see. These are all like bits of the biology of perception behind perception that we usually can't see, but for some reason I had this thing happen where all of a sudden I could see it and it was before that chronic fatigue thing that I had. And I wrote down that thought is a type of dizziness of not looking at the now and giving voice to it. And language is not required most of the time. Maybe language was originally from beauty. Originally it arose from beauty. And then somehow we managed to turn it ugly. So I might make another video. I'm not sure. Tomorrow morning I will plan some things to do with this car. So maybe I will have some other scenery besides the corner of my little room. I'm out looking for an eagle or a hawk feather. It was really windy last night, so I just had a feeling that I might find one. Like one would just magically blow somewhere. Did find bear poop. This is baby bear. And this is mama bear. And I found something else of interest. I don't know where it is, but I didn't find a feather. But I'm wondering if I will at some point. But I just wanted to make a quick video because this is definitely something a manic would do. Is just be out for a walk and then divert to where one feels there might be an eagle feather or a hawk feather. I don't see that other thing. Oh, there it is, I think. This looks like some kind of shoulder blade. Some kind of animal. The thing that's cool about relaxed perception is that if it's in the field of vision, 
and one isn't looking for that needle in the haystack. The peripheral vision will pick it up. So one doesn't really have to try to look for anything. So we'll see how long it takes my brain to find it without trying to find it. Because I may not go out again looking for it purposefully. It seems like it's sort of like setting, I don't want to say an intention, but maybe a, a possibility. Intention sounds very willful. Whereas possibility invites the participation of the whole universe. 